Hi, my name is Grace Broussard, and today I'm going to talk to you about birth mother grief and the adoption climate. So, my research question for this review is what is a birth mother's journey and how does this change based on the circumstances of the adoption? In this presentation, when I refer to adoption climate, I mean any of the social norms, opinions, and attitudes that are surrounding adoption during the time period. And when I say birth mother, I'm speaking of any woman who has had and placed their child for adoption during any time. So a little bit of background and context. Um, in the literature, I found that each era is characterized with different attitudes and opinions surrounding adoption. So I'm gonna break those down and show you the differences in how women are treated throughout their pregnancy and treated after they've adopted their child or they've placed their child. Um, these attitudes and opinions play a huge role in why women may choose to place, um, how their families may influence them, and just socially what was told to do during that time period. Overall, trauma um, is a very, big theme throughout this whole review. Many women are experiencing a lot of trauma as they place their child because adoption creates a lot of loss. So themes such as grief, shame, guilt, they're all very common feelings. And a lot of unprocessed grief um, appears and can manifest in a very negative way. So we're gonna talk about the different ways that women can uh, process their grief and use the support services so that they don't manifest in a negative way. So my findings I broke down into three different categories. So we have adoption climate, birth mother journey, and birth mother support. The first one, adoption climate, is about each era. So each era brings different attitudes and opinions surrounding adoption. The 1920s post-World War I era, there was no sexual education, no access to birth control. Abortion was not something that you could easily access as well. So there was high rates of adolescent unplanned pregnancy and young adult unplanned pregnancy during this time. The social middle class was rising, so this middle class was getting bigger and rising, so their social status was more important to them. Um, boys were having access to their dad's car, their parents' car, so they could take that cute girl out and they could go parking, which we know doesn't really just mean sitting in a car and parked. Um, so there was higher rates of pregnancy and many girls felt that they could not speak to their parents about this. This is not, this is a very taboo topic during the time. So they would try to hide their pregnancy and when they couldn't hide it any longer because pregnancy needs to be shown, um, they were often sent to a home for unwed mothers. So these homes for unmed, unwed mothers were generally run by the Catholic Church or by the state where all the young women who were pregnant would go live together and then when it was time to have their baby they'd be sent to the hospital and all of it would be taken care of and then their parents would pick them up, go home, return to high school, college, work, whatever stage and pretend as nothing had happened. Many girls during this time were told their, well, their parents would tell their family, friends, neighbors that they were just visiting another relative or they were sending a bride. So nobody talked about it and they were to pretend as if nothing had happened and just move on with their life. Um, this woman in this next video clip I'm going to show you has a very accurate uh, take on what it felt like to be a birth mother during this time and it seemed consistent with many other birth mothers in the literature. So. It was such a shameful thing in those days to be single and pregnant was an, an, and then an unmarried mother in our kind of middle class circle was just not the right thing. A social worker came into the room um, and said, just chatted for a little while, oh, what a lovely baby, can I hold him? So I handed Ian to her and I never was allowed to hold him again. So it was a very numbing experience and I can't really remember even crying, it was just unreal. <laughs> it was as if it was happening to somebody else. Okay, so this woman's experience is pretty consistent with other, others during this time and if a woman decided that she did not want to place her baby anymore after she had been through this whole process, the the tactics got a little manipulative um, and coercive. Uh, their financial resources were brought up. Do you have enough money to pay for your eight month stay at a home and your hospital costs? And can you afford to raise a baby? Are you ready to deal with this? And so it was very scary for a young woman during this time. Um, so often there was a lot of shame and repressed feelings that got pushed under. But in the 1970s to the present era, this whole adoption climate has shifted. So the common themes of this time are access to birth control, access to abortion. Um, there's higher rates of divorce, which means that single motherhood is more socially acceptable. Open adoption has become hugely popular with um, it almost doubling in size from 1987 to 1993. 
So women are given choices in open adoption with the family they choose to place with and the contact agreement they want to have with this family and their child. So the birth mother journey um, throughout these different kinds of adoption is different. So with open adoption, women report more positive outcomes. They perceive themselves better. They are more at peace with the child's well-being. They have less anxiety and lesser chance of having a PTSD um, encounter. But with closed adoption, many women are experiencing very repressed feelings of shame, guilt, anger, sadness, and they have higher rates of PTSD and anxiety within that, um, that demographic. But no matter the type of adoption, there's still grief and loss universally. So grief can manifest in different ways if it's not processed, such as infertility, marriage problems, addiction, depression, and overprotectiveness of any other children. So in order for women to positively move on from this adoption and have it be a part of their story, they need to process their grief. Which leads me to our final category, birth mother support. So this need for support was apparent. So in the 1980s, a national support group called Concern United Birth Parents um, was formed where all these birth parents, so both men and women, could come together to share their insights and experiences about placing a child for adoption. Now this support group still runs today, which is really awesome. They provide yearly annual retreats for anyone who's been touched by adoption, as well as anybody who feels as if they are interested. So social workers, therapists, other professionals are more than welcome to attend this place. But there is still problems with the support. So although there is this great support group, many women are still reporting those adverse experiences. So if a counselor or therapist is not adoption competent, this means that they're a little bit ignorant about adoption and the feelings that come with it. And they're dismissive, they don't really understand, they're kind of gonna brush off and unvalidate a woman's feelings. When these birth mothers are really needing validation, support, respect, consideration, and just to be taken seriously after their adoption. So Harrington puts it best by saying the methods have changed from shunning to praising. That's it. So instead of being shamed for um, having this unplanned pregnancy, to being praised for giving a family a baby, women are still saying, no, that's not enough support. We need to be taken seriously and validated for our feelings and our processing of this grief. So that's why this discussion is so important because this gap has been exposed for these mental health implications. So women are needing these wraparound services such as adoption competent counseling, support groups, and others to share their experience with. Um, it's really important because I think that adoption agencies and providers need to be attuned to the adoption climate. They need to provide this counseling and these support groups and these services to their clients who are the birth mothers throughout their pregnancy, during placement, and after placement and beyond because this adoption will forever be a part of this woman's story. Um, and I think that this is best practice to provide these wraparound services. This is all relevant because women are still choosing to place their babies for adoption. And in the year 2018, the Adoption Council reported that 4,059 children were placed for adoption just within the United States, which is a lot of babies when you think, realize that it takes nine months to have a baby. So adoption is still occurring quite a bit. It's very relevant to this time period. So agencies and providers need to be able to provide this support for these women during this time. The strengths and limitations of these articles include um, just direct research from directly from birth mothers, the questionnaires, interviews, um, and research methods used were very encompassing to really gauge an accurate representation of how birth mothers are feeling. It's limited though because there's a limited scope of birth mothers and there's a very huge lack of diversity. So most women who participated in these studies were white and middle class, um, but also there's a lot of birth mothers who don't come forward because of shame, because of guilt. Um, and also sometimes birth mothers are recalling memories from 20 to 30 years ago, so they may be slightly inaccurate with kind of hindsight bias. Of this literature review, the strengths include very recent relevant articles as well as a variety of sources that were used. Um, and the limitations are there's just not very much birth mother research out there. Um, when I was going through my methods, I was able to find lots of research on adopted families, ab adopted children, but birth mothers are kind of um, a smaller demographic and often haven't been researched. So it was limited in that regard. The methods I used, um, I used EBSCO host databases and Google Scholar during September 2019. The terms that yielded the best re results were birth mother, grief, pregnant, and adopt. Um, all the articles selected were published between 2000 and 2019, so they're very relevant, and they were all published in the United States. They're all qualitative as well because they, I wanted to examine the depth of birth mother feelings, and I used a variety of sources. Here are my references. <laughs> And i just like to say thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation, and hopefully you're able to gain some insight on birth mothers and their experience. Thanks.